Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, Look, he's calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink, saying, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out, cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Less and of Joseph and Salome, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Why do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Why do you believe that a Jewish man rejected by his own people and delivered over to the Romans to be crucified was the only Son of God and the only Savior of sinners? Many years ago, in the mid-90s, I was evangelizing on a university campus in Las Vegas, and Carl will remember these days well. He once had to bail me out of jail uh, as a result of it. But uh, as I was there to evangelize people, a Muslim man approached me, and he asked me that very question. Why do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Of course, Muslims do not believe that. Well, in response, I pointed him to several things, to Christ's personal claims. I pointed him to Christ's miracles, his authority over the demons, his power over nature. And in response, the gentleman began to yell and cause a scene. He began to say a number of things that were more vulgar than I'll express to you. But among them, he said, your God was born of a woman. Your God was born of a woman who was then considered unclean and had to go offer sacrifices at the temple for her purification. Your God had his diapers changed. Your God was whipped, beaten, mocked, had his beard plucked out, and even cried out on the cross saying, why have you forsaken me? Well, among the many other things that I was thinking at the time, one of the things that dawned on me is that this man, for all of his agitated remarks was giving evidence of the very thing that the gospel say is true of the natural man and his response to the gospel of Christ. In many ways, I felt like I was there at the foot of the cross. The man, I expected almost to say, come down from the cross or uh, why didn't uh, Elijah come to save him? Well, the other thing that I learned is that although it was a stumbling block to this man, he was really giving the other half of the gospel what I had neglected to say. And, in fact, and ironically, he was giving the very thing that Mark and the other gospel writers actually point to, not as the great disproof of our Lord's sonship, but as the supreme revelation of it. Well, before looking at how Mark makes this point in chapter 15, you need to keep several things in mind about Mark's book, about the thesis of the book, its plot, its structure. Unlike the Apostle John, who waited till the end of the book before he told you, tells you the thesis, or Matthew and Luke, who make the job a little bit harder, Mark states his thesis right up front. In the first verse of the gospel, Mark says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That is the spirit-inspired thesis, the organizing theme of the book. Everything in the book is pointing to that great truth. This is why virtually at every turn in the gospel, you have someone bearing witness to our Lord's divine sonship. The Father, for example, at the baptism of Jesus, before we even get out of the first chapter, declares that, the, that Jesus, being baptized by John, is his son. As well, at the transfiguration, the Father testifies this is his son. And even the demons, remarkably, every time they see Jesus, they run before him, throw themselves down, and cry out, We know who you are, the Son of God. What do you want with us, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Have you come to destroy us? That's the thesis of Mark's book. Well, in light of this, it's remarkable to note, and here you especially need to pay attention. This reveals the plot of the book. For all of the testimony that's being given to Jesus by the Father, by the demons, 
There's not a single human being in the entirety of Mark's gospel who ever takes that confession upon his lips until we get to the centurion, which shows, by the way, that this is the climax of the gospel. But throughout the gospel of Mark, what we find instead are people saying, who is this man? Where did he get this wisdom? Where did such authority come to him? How does he command even the wind and the sea? Not even Peter in Mark's gospel confesses our Lord's sonship. That might be surprising to you. If I were to ask when Jesus said to the disciples, who do you say that I am? What did Peter reply? You'd all probably say, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And you know that's Peter's answer because Matthew tells us that. But when Mark records it, Mark only says that Peter said, you are the Christ. Of course, Mark and Matthew aren't contradicting each other here. But there's something significant that's going on. Mark is trying to highlight something. Mark is trying to highlight something you can learn from both Mark and Matthew. And that is that even for uh, all of the truthfulness of Peter's confession, he does not yet fully understand what that means. Remember, in both Mark and Matthew, Peter goes on to object when Jesus then goes on to talk about his coming passion, his coming crucifixion, his suffering and dying. In Peter's mind, these two things don't go together. Jesus can't both be the Son of God worthy of all glory and also suffer the shameful, humiliating death of the cross. And so Peter objects. This shows that Peter had a partial understanding. It was not yet perfect. He did not understand that Christ's sonship did not preclude going to the cross. And so Mark skillfully leaves out that part of his confession. What's going on here, as Jesus goes on to say, is that something has to happen in order for Peter to fully realize what it means to call him son of God. That's the plot of the book. But now, a uh, final thing I want you to keep in mind is the structure. The crucifixion in Mark 15 is the last of three great events that structure the gospel. The baptism in chapter 1, the transfiguration in chapter 9, and the crucifixion in chapter 15. It's obvious that these passages are fundamentally linked and that Mark wants, to see us, uh, wants us to see them as linked because he does a number of things to, to, do, uh, to make this connection for us. For example, recall that in chapter 1, Jesus was baptized by John, whose eccentric diet and clothing identified him as an Elijah-like figure, the one who came in the spirit and power of Elijah. When you look at the transfiguration, who is it that appears together with Jesus? It's Elijah and Moses. In fact, Elijah is the topic of conversation as they're coming down the mountain. And finally, at the crucifixion, when Jesus cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, speaking in Aramaic from the cross, the bystanders think that he's calling upon Elijah. Well, another thing that shows that these three events are linked is that all of them may be viewed as baptismal events. The first is obvious. Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan. But even the transfiguration may be viewed as a baptismal event. Remember that this, the, the glory cloud came down, the Father came down, and Jesus entered into the cloud. This is the same language that Paul used to speak of Israel's baptism in the, through the Red Sea. Remember in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul said, all were baptized in the cloud and in the sea. And finally, with respect to the crucifixion, it's the same thing. In fact, Jesus explicitly in Mark's gospel referred to it as his coming baptism. He said to his disciples, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism with which I'm going to be baptized? Jesus was there referring to the fact that he was going to drink the cup of divine wrath that was going to be poured out upon him for us. Well, another thing that shows that these events are linked is Mark's reference to something being torn. At the baptism of Jesus, the heavens were torn. The Spirit descended and the Father spoke. We're not told explicitly that the heavens were torn at the transfiguration, but it's assumed by the very fact that the Father doesn't only speak, he descends into their midst. This answers to Isaiah's cry in Isaiah 64, 1, when he said, Oh, that you would tear the heavens and come down. Finally, at the crucifixion, what happens when Jesus cries out his final cry, his victory cry? The veil of the temple is torn in two from top to bottom. In fact, it's obvious that Mark is bringing these two things together because the Greek word that Mark uses is different than what's used in the other Gospels. And it's a word that's only used twice. Mark 1 at the baptism, Mark 15 at the crucifixion. 
Finally, it should be remembered that the goal of all three of these events is to identify and mark out Jesus, no pun intended, mark out Jesus as the Son of God. Remember, at the baptism, the Father said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. At the transfiguration, this is my beloved Son, listen to him. And then at the crucifixion, these words of the Father pass to the lips of a Gentile centurion, saying, Surely this was the Son of God. And with those in, things in mind, let us now go and ask the Father to help us see this text and what it tells us about his Son. Let's pray. Holy Father, we come now asking in the name of Christ, your beloved Son, that you would through him give us your spirit, that we might hear him speak to us in your word, and that we might be transformed by it, that we might love him more and serve him better. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Well, the main point that I want you to see is, as we look at this text is that the cross of Christ is the supreme revelation of his sonship. The cross of Christ is the supreme revelation of his sonship, and we'll see this in two ways. First, we'll see it in verses 33 through 36 in his suffering. We'll see that his suffering reveals him to be the Son of God. Second, in verses 37 through 39, we will see that Jesus was revealed to be the Son of God in his death. Now, notice as we begin to look at this that both of these sections parallel each other. Both sections make reference to an apocalyptic sign a supernatural sign, the darkening of the heavens in verse 33 and the tearing of the temple veil. Both sections also speak of a great cry being issued by our Lord, the cry of dereliction, why have you forsaken me, and the cry of victory when Jesus breathes his last and gives up his spirit. But then finally, and this is critical, this shows you that this text is relevant to you. We also see a response on the part of bystanders. In the first case, we see the bystanders who respond in unbelief and mockery. And then we see the response of the centurion responding in faith that Jesus is the Son of God. No matter who you are this evening, you fall into one or another of those two categories. This text speaks to you. This text demands your attention. Well, look then with me at uh, that first point that I mentioned, that the suffering of Christ proves his sonship. In verse 33, we begin with Mark telling us about a sign. Now, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Well, earlier in the context, in Mark 15, 25, we're told that Jesus was put on the cross at the third hour, which means 9 a.m. Later, we're told that Jesus breathed his last at the ninth hour, which means 3 p.m. So Jesus was put on the cross at 9 a.m., which was the time, by the way, of the morning sacrifice. And he died at 3 p.m., which was the time of the evening sacrifice. Already, we see something of how Scripture is being fulfilled here. Uh, but Mark tells us that from the uh, middle of that time period, basically from noon, 12 to 3, the sun went dark. Well, what does this mean? Well, uh, there are a lot of people who attempt to explain this away as, as an eclipse, and, and part of the reason they want to do this is because this is not simply attested in the Gospels. There are pagan sources that make reference to the sun going dark, and so they can't simply dismiss it uh, on the grounds that, well, that's in that, uh, that book that we know isn't from God. So they have to deal with it in spite of themselves, and so many of them will say that this was a, an eclipse. The problem is this is taking place at the time of the Passover, which means that the moon was on the opposite side of the earth from the sun. No eclipse was possible under such conditions. No, this was a supernatural event. But what does it mean? What was this sign about? Well, if this was a supernatural event, a sign from God, then the only one who can tell us what this sign means is God. Now, happily, we have the scriptures like a light in the darkness to tell us what it means. Whenever God gives a sign, he also gives the meaning. He doesn't leave it up to us to assign meaning to it. Well, the first thing that helps us to understand what's going on here is the first mention of darkness in Scripture. Remember that when creation came forth from the hand of God, we're told that it existed in a state of chaos, if you will, a state of being uninhabited and uninhabitable. But then, punctuating the darkness was God's word, let there be light. And then over the course of six days, we know that God brought everything into a state of cosmos, a, a world that could be inhabited and was inhabited by man, God's Sabbath-keeping creature. Well, as we move through Scripture, we begin to see that this 
whole idea develops into a motif. Throughout scripture, the prophets will often borrow the imagery from creation when they want to speak, for example, of judgment, especially of judgment. When God brings judgment on men and nations, it's often described as the sun going dark. Well, no event illustrates this better than the exodus from Egypt. Remember that through a series of ten words, ten plagues, God reduced Egypt to a state of primeval chaos, as if it had never been created. And one of those plagues was the plague of darkness, a darkness that lasted for three days. And don't forget that at the same time, God was doing something great and marvelous. He was bringing about a new creation. He was redeeming his people, Israel, his firstborn son, delivering her by the blood of the Passover lamb and through the waters of the sea. Well, there are many other passages that speak to this, but there's none so relevant as Amos 8 9. And I want you to turn to this passage in your Bible, uh, this one you especially need to see because it draws together all the threads of the motif as it's found in the Old Testament, and it points straight to Jesus. In Amos 8, verse 9, speaking of judgment to come, the Lord says, And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon. That is, the sixth hour. And I will darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts, in other words, your new moons, your Passover celebrations, into mourning, and all your songs into lamentations. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like mourning for an only son, and its end like a bitter day. Here the Lord describes a period when his judgment will fall. That judgment will coincide with the sun going dark at midday, and people mourning as though for an only son. When the Jews translated the Old Testament into Greek two centuries before the coming of our Lord, the way they rendered this passage is very interesting. They, in reference to an only son, the, the phrase they used was agapitas huios, which are the exact words used by Mark in the baptism and transfiguration. This is my beloved son. So when Mark uses that language, he's already pointing you to the fact that Jesus is going to die, to the fact that Christ's sonship does not preclude his coming death, but actually reveals it. When Jesus comes, he's coming in fulfillment of the Old Testament scripture, showing that he is the one that the Father had spoken of in the Old Testament. Well, the fact that the darkness is a sign of judgment is further pointed up by our Lord's cry in verse 34. This cry on the part of our Lord speaks to the fact that Jesus is not just enduring great physical suffering, and certainly that, uh, the very word excruciating comes from the word for crucifixion. But he's crying out in utter forsakenness to the Father. This was the great horror of the cross, the great thing that our Lord was enduring. This is what Jesus meant when he spoke of drinking the cup, of the cup of wrath being poured out upon him. This is what Jesus so agonized over in the garden, the cup that he had to drink. The very fact that Mark uses the original Aramaic here of Jesus shows you just how earnest this cry was. It's indelibly written on Mark's mind. He's got to give it to you in the Aramaic. He's pointing to the intensity of this suffering for our Lord, not only in his body, but in his soul. The darkness symbolizes to us the great horror of the cross, the fact that Jesus, who dwelt in unapproachable light with the Father, we, we've yet to, to know what that means, but he dwelt in unapproachable light with the Father, and here is being estranged from him for our sins because of our transgressions. Well, in his cry of utter forsakenness, a cry so opposite to what many would expect from one who is the Son of God, and perhaps the great disproof of it, we actually know that this passage points to an Old Testament passage, Psalm 22, a psalm, by the way, that's been at play all throughout this text. In Mark 15, 24, we're told that they divided up his garments and cast lots for his clothing, which is a fulfillment of Psalm 22, 18. In, in Mark 15, 29, we're told that the people were passing by him and wagging their heads, a fulfillment of Psalm 22, 7. Well, this psalm, Psalm 22, that features so prominently in this passage is one of three great Old Testament texts that speak of the Messiah being pierced. You should remember uh, not only that passage where he says, they've pierced my hands and my feet, but those two other passages. In fact, I, I'm going to have you turn to Zechariah 12.10 so that we can see it. But just to remind you of that other one, it's in Isaiah 53 where it says, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised 
for our iniquity. But look with me at Zechariah 12.10. Notice that Zechariah here picks up on the language of Amos. In fact, he picks up on the language of Isaiah 50, the Old Testament passage that we read earlier. In Zechariah 12.10 it says, this is the Lord speaking, they will look upon me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as they mourn for an only son. A beloved son, again, the same term that's used in Mark's gospel. The same term that's used to mark out Jesus as God's son and to point toward the work that he's going to perform. This means then that when Jesus cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? While it really expresses the pain and uh, torment that Jesus is experiencing in body and soul, it's also pointing to the fact that it's the son who's suffering in body and soul. Well, given the occurrence of this supernatural sign and the content of our Lord's cry, both of which were pre-announced in the prophetic scriptures, we should find it surprising how the bystanders responded at the foot of the cross. Earlier, the Jews had indicated that they would believe if only they were given a sign from heaven. Well, here they were given a sign from heaven. The heavens go dark. And scriptures, scripture after scripture, in fact, is being fulfilled in their hearing, in, in their, well, literally their hearing, because they're not seeing a whole lot. But instead of responding in faith, we're told that they respond in unbelieving mockery. They continue the mockery that had been taking place prior to our text this evening. Behold, he's calling for Elijah, and let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. These are words of sheer unbelief. Even the action of offering Jesus sour wine was intended to invigorate him. This was the sort of thing that uh, people would do sometimes at the cross to prolong people's suffering. Even that points up their unbelief. Well, I said you should find that surprising, but in another sense, you shouldn't find it surprising. Their, their unbelief in the face of clear evidence. Remember, all of this is taking place in the context of noonday darkness, which is a perfect picture of the unbeliever who walks in the futility of his mind, being darkened in his understanding, as the Apostle Paul said. But if you're here this evening and you don't believe, if somebody grabbed you by the arm and dragged you kicking and screaming to church, perhaps you've been sitting there flattering yourself, saying that you don't believe because there just isn't any evidence. Recognize that these men had the same nature that you have, the same nature you were born with. These men had evidence coming out their ears, and yet they didn't believe. As well, if you are a covenant child here this morning, you heard in the sermon this morning that God works through families, but you also heard that there are occasions when certain people don't grow up to believe what they've been taught. Don't miss the fact that these men who are ridiculing Jesus and mocking him are part of the visible church. These were Jews. These aren't Gentiles saying, maybe Elijah's going to come. These are Jews. They went to synagogue every Sabbath day. They heard the scriptures read in their hearing over and over again. They had much of the Old Testament memorized. And they responded in unbelieving mockery, even as those very scriptures are being fulfilled in their presence. I would plead with you this evening if you are a covenant child and you have not bowed the knee to the Lord Jesus, put your trust in him. Don't be like these men. Well, uh, having seen how the Lord Jesus is revealed in his suffering to be the Son of God, let's turn now to verses 37 through 39 and see how our Lord was revealed to be the Son of God in his death. First, behold the second sign mentioned in verse 38, the tearing of the temple veil. Here again, you should be asking yourself, what does this sign mean? This is not a natural occurrence. That curtain was thick and, and it wasn't something that would be torn naturally or even with a lot of human effort. Well, in this case, we can make a quick work of it. We, uh, Mark has already told us essentially what this means. Remember, at the beginning of the gospel, Mark told us that when Jesus was baptized, the heavens were torn and the Father spoke. It issued forth in the declaration that Jesus is his son. Essentially what Mark is doing here in speaking of the veil being torn is saying that now the revelation of Christ has been made open. It's now uh, freely made known to the world. 
and in fact through him the way of access has been made uh, open to us to the Father. Well, interestingly enough, uh, according to Josephus, a uh, first century Jewish historian, uh, there, one of the veils on the temple had a tapestry on it of the heavens. Whether or not Mark is referring to that particular veil, though, is, is not overly relevant, but interesting. But it's clear that what Mark is doing is he's saying, look, in the death of Christ, the, the whole significance of what the temple stood for, everything that the Old Testament had recorded about the way of approach unto God being made through his Son has now been fulfilled. The Son has come. The Son has put an end to all those rituals. The Son has made open our approach unto God. Well, in verse 37, we're told that our Lord let out another great cry and breathed his last. And here, Mark is telling us several things. First, that our Lord's death was voluntary, something under his full control, which, again, points up the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, that he had the authority to lay down his life and the authority to take it up again. The centurion who was trained at watching crucifixions knew that it was not the case that people would normally die that quickly. And so when he sees Jesus cry out and then die only six hours after being on the cross, that had to be startling to him. And don't forget, in the context of the sun going dark and the veil of the temple being torn. By the way, don't miss the fact that there's a bunch of events that are now converging here. There's a bunch of events that are converging. Not only did Jesus cry out in the temple veil tear at the same time, that's what Mark is pointing up in, in uh, the text, but the lights of the heavens go back on. Remember, Mark said from noon till three. Jesus lets out that great cry in the darkness at three, and the lights go back on. And the lights go back on not only for the world, but for the centurion. It's precisely because all these events converge that the, we're told in Mark that it, because it was in this manner that when the centurion saw that it was in this manner that Jesus died, he said, surely this was the Son of God. Now, even though the centurion was not a Jew, he, he lived in Israel, he served in Israel, he would have known something of Jewish customs. And it's interesting then to observe that in first century Jewish culture, how a father would respond to the death of his son, especially his only son. When a father lost his only son, he would do several things. He would tear his clothing, he would put on sackcloth, and he would put the lights out in the house. And so picture yourself in the shoes of the centurion. This is what the centurion is seeing. He knows that this is how Jews respond to the death of their only son, and now he witnesses the light of the heavens go out and being clothed with sackcloth and the veil of God's house, the temple, being torn. What's the question that naturally comes to mind? Well, whose son must this be? And the natural answer is the answer of the centurion. Surely this was the Son of God. This, by the way, is the answer to our Lord's why question. There, there are two different ways you can understand our Lord's why question. Why in the sense of cause, for what cause have you forsaken me? Or why in the sense of purpose, for what end, for what purpose have you forsaken me? The centurion's response is the answer. So that you would come to acknowledge him as the Son of God. That is why Jesus was nailed to the cross. That is why Jesus suffered the wrath of God. Apart from Jesus taking away the guilt of our sin and removing the corruption of our soul, which is all based on his cross work and the work of his spirit, there could be no confession of Christ. This is why Peter had only a partial understanding up to this point. The cross had not yet come. Peter's uh, understanding had not yet been fully uh, completed, perfected. Well, if you're a believer this evening but uh, struggle perhaps to know the certainty of what you've come to confess, you might be thinking to yourself, all of this assumes two things, and it does. That these things are all true, what the Gospels say, and that they mean what the Bible says they mean. Well, Mark answers both of these questions. First of all, in verses 40 through 41, we're told of our Lord's women followers. We're told that they were with him during his earthly ministry, and they're now present at the cross. Mark will make the same point later about the burial and the crucifixion, or the, the resurrection. The women were present for all of these events. And what Mark is doing is establishing a continuing chain of witnesses. But now, as an aside, don't, don't miss this fact. Mark has not mentioned women up to this point in his gospel. But you notice that Mark says these women have been very active. One of the indications, or one of the things that this shows is that, is that these women were content to work humbly behind the scenes. They weren't clamoring to be apostles. 
or deacons or elders. They were serving humbly behind the scenes the Lord Jesus. And so here Mark brings them into the picture because Mark is saying that these women who were with him all along were witnesses to these events. Well now, why is that significant? Well, one of the criterion that historians use to sift out true from false events that are recorded in history is known as the principle of embarrassment. And that principle says that if an author is writing something and making things up, he's not going to make something up that's embarrassing to him. He's not going to make up something that in that context would make him look like a fool. Well, in first century Jewish context, the witness of women was not highly valued. If Mark were making this up, he wouldn't have said that women were the primary witnesses to this event. He would have said Peter or Matthew or John, anything but women. No, the reason Mark says that women saw it is because that's what happened. That's how it took place. Well, seeing this point, you might still be wondering, how do we know that all of these events mean what Scripture says they mean? How do we know that the interpretation given in Scripture of these signs is their actual meaning? So what if Christ died on the cross? Strange things happen. And, you know, sun going dark, strange things happen. Look at the Bermuda Triangle. How do we know that these things mean what God says they mean? Well, Mark has answered that question for us as well, because Mark has told us over and over again that all of these events are taking place according to Old Testament prophecy, which means they've been pre-announced and therefore pre-interpreted. Anybody who wants to stand up and say that these things mean something different than what Jehovah says in his word, or wants to say that their God says it means something different, let them show that their God announced these things in advance. Baal didn't announce these things in advance. He doesn't own their interpretation. Neither did Chemosh or Dagon or Allah. No, Jehovah alone declared it. Jehovah alone has done it, and Jehovah alone holds the key to its interpretation. How does this all apply to us? Calvin once said that all the wisdom of believers is comprehended in the cross of Christ. And certainly it is. If you are a believer this evening in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've confessed him from the heart, if you have genuine faith that he is the beloved son of the Father, then this text is full of instruction for you. Well, first of all, we've already been told several things that we should make of this text. Everything that uh, the, the book of Mark is driving toward. Remember the Father at the baptism of Jesus said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus is the object of the Father's delight. All his love reposes in him. And if then he is the object of the Father's delight, how much more should he be your delight, on whom your very salvation depends, the one who died on the cross and experienced utter forsakenness of the Father? One of the things that delighting in Christ should do is turning you away from the pleasures of sin. If you delight in Christ, you can't also delight in sin. Well, second, because Jesus is the Son of the Father, you are to listen to him. Remember the Father on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my Son. What does that mean? Listen to him. Listen to him when he tells you to take up your cross and follow him. Again, that was Peter's difficulty, remember, that not only that Jesus was going to the cross, but that this meant that Peter had to go and bear the cross as well. Jesus said, unless you do this, you're not worthy of me. You don't belong to me. He was telling Peter that the very essence of the gospel and of the Christian life is suffering and service, is pursuing God's call even in the midst of suffering. Peter couldn't see how those two things together. If you're ever tempted to look upon your suffering and think that this is an indication to you that you should stop believing in Jesus or pursuing God's call, recognize it for what it is, a satanic lie. Remember Jesus' rebuke to Peter. Get behind me, Satan. This was not a light matter. Peter was telling Jesus, that's not the way forward. Jesus says it's the only way forward. It's the same temptation that was made to Jesus in the garden. If you're the son of God, don't go the way of the cross. Pursue money, the kingdoms of the world, all these other things. Bow down and worship me. These are all satanic lies. Jesus calls us to listen to him, not only when the wind is at our back, but even when the cross is at our back. Well, a final thing this text demonstrates is that you can throw off the embarrassment of the world and be certain of what you have come to confess. You can be certain both about what happened and what it means. 
You can say with Paul that I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all that believe. Earlier I mentioned a Muslim man who came up to me ridiculing the Lord Jesus, mocking him. Your God was beaten. Your God was crucified. Your God cried out, why have you forsaken me? Well, as everyone began to look at him, he started causing a scene. You might find it hard to believe that I'm not very loud in these contexts normally. So this gentleman started to attract a crowd. Everybody started look, looking at him. As he was saying, your God was beaten. Your God was crucified. Your God cried out, why have you forsaken me? I realized in that moment that this man was preaching the gospel. And so I took a step back and I said, amen, preach it. And as all eyes turned on him, he began to flush red with embarrassment. And he no longer caused a scene. He slunk away. But ever since then, I've been fond of entertaining the possibility that God used that man's preaching to save many people that day. Uh, God has done stranger things. Look at the Bermuda Triangle. Well, what I learned that day and what you ought to learn from Mark 15, what you ought to be all the more confident in and quick to confess even to those who consider it foolishness, especially to those who consider it foolishness, is that the answer to the question, why do you believe that a Jewish man who was re rejected by his own people and delivered over to the cross to die is the only son of God and savior of sinner, is precisely because he suffered and died. Jesus suffered and died in accordance with the Old Testament. He was perfectly obedient to his father and he paid the price of sin. All of this reveals him to be the son of God and worthy of your faith and obedience.